It's my pleasure tonight to introduce our own program chair person, Janet Barger, who's going to present our program for us tonight. According to the Dahlonega Nugget, she will discuss the history uh, of the Chattahoochee National Forest and its impact on the community. She'll talk about logging and forest management leading to the preservation, the influence of Benton McKay with a focus on the Benton McKay Trail, and she'll also tell us something about that well-known uh, forest uh, ranger, Arthur Woody himself. Janet, the floor is yours. This presentation, you know, you never really know quite where something's going to go until you get into it, and that was kind of the way it was with this. And, um, it was one of those things as I started doing research, I had to kind of keep myself focused. Um, so there are some kind of random pictures in here that I included simply because I thought they were interesting to the historical society, but I, I tried to base everything around the theme of the forest. And I have to tell you, um, if you, I could not find in my research a single picture of logging in Lumpkin County. Not one. Lots of mining. Uh, I know they must be out there somewhere. So what I had to do was... All right, logging started on a large scale out in the far west. Um, but then as some of the lands became available in the east, the railroads were being built, uh, some of the companies began buying up land in North Georgia, Kentucky, Tennessee. Um, the Ritter Company um, in North Georgia and uh, was active in Tennessee, and those are some pictures. And I find it interesting, if you look at the bottom right picture, um, you know, there's just not that many trees that large around anymore. Um, that they were, what, a lot of what they were cutting was virgin timber. Um, and we'll never see trees of the magnitude that they were cutting in our lifetime. Of course, all of this was not really good uh, for the land. This picture was taken uh, up at the Hiawassee River around 1912. Um, and one of the locals, Ronald Eller, talked about how a lot of land was acquired. He said the first timber and mineral buyers who rode into the mountains were commonly greeted with hospitality by local residents. Strangers were few in the remote hollers, and a traveler offered the opportunity for conversation and change from the rhythms of daily life. The land agent's routine was simple. Riding horseback into the countryside, he would search the coves and creek banks for valuable timber stands. And having found his objective, he would approach the cabin of the unsuspecting farmer. The farmer's cordial greeting was usually followed by an invitation to share the family's meal and even accommodations for the night. After dinner, while entertaining the family with news of the outside world, the travel traveler would casually produce a bag of coins and offer to purchase a tract of unused ridge land, which he had noticed while journeying through the area. Such an officer will, offer was hard to refuse in most rural areas where hard money was scarce and life was difficult. So the money often provided a welcome opportunity for a family to leave a farm that had been worn out, and in North Georgia especially, the farm population was greater than the land could reasonably support, so people sold willingly. In other areas, people were more reluctant to sell, and some unscrupulous firms enlisted the aid of local merchants who would make purchases for dummy corporations. This is another one. Again, this is North Georgia, and they were all familiar with the practice of clear-cutting, and we all know what happens when you clear-cut on a steep slope. Um, then you have erosion. Sorry, the late 1800s from about 18, uh, 1880 to about 1917. Now, uh, once the land was acquired, timber companies often did not cut the timber immediately, and some of them never cut it at all. And most of the, I hope I'm pronouncing this right, Fister Vogel lands of northern Georgia were never cut by the firm at all. And uh, thankfully, the Vogel family uh, donated the land that they owned over, um, just over the mountain in Union County uh, for a park, which is one of the most beautiful places in North Georgia. The next one, um, 
talk about other stressors of the forest is mining. Does anybody happen to recognize where that is? That's not too, actually not that far from here. That's at Copper Hill, McKaysville, up on the Georgia-Tennessee state line. Um, this picture was taken in September 1905 when the plant was undergoing an expansion. Um, the forest all around the area, deep down into Georgia, uh, died from the sulfur fumes of the smokestacks. Um, what was the plant? Was it a mining plant? Yeah, copper mine. Yeah, copper mine. Copper mine. Mm -hmm. It looked like a landscape marsh for a long time. Yeah, it did. It still doesn't look good. Well, there's finally some trees growing. Yeah. Yeah, it still looks uh, pretty bad. Um, next one is something that we've seen plenty of pictures of before, and y'all have probably seen this one. This is in Lumpke County of the hydraulic mining in the New York Cut, and I, did, I don't know where that is, uh, but it is, in, it is listed in Lumpke County. Okay. I was not sure. I just, it just came under, it was identified as being in Lumpke County. As is the, um, the next one. And, of course, that's the Finley Tunnel. I've been looking for that picture. Here it is. <laughs> <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> is that from the Vanishing Georgia? Uh, that is not from Vanishing Georgia. I don't remember where I got that one. Okay. All right. Um, I like that big hat. Got it too. Okay. And the next one is um, the Pruitt Cut Hand Mine. I know about the hand ditch, but anyway, also Lumpkin County. Um, but hydraulic mining, which thankfully they eventually outlawed, but we can still see the scars of it. I'm pretty sure we had these around here too, but I had I didn't know what this was. A spl but evidently they used a splash dam to get the logs off. They would dam up a creek and uh, dump the logs into it, and then they would open the dam so that they could wash down, um, where they could either be picked up by the railroad, and of course you can just imagine, um, you know, the logs going downstream and the erosion from all of that. That's an adaptation of the Dahlonega method of gold mining. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. sure is. And uh, as we know, nothing um, goes like water. Again, uh, I believe this is Raven, Raven County, but I was interested that they use oxen to get the logs out of the mountain. And the next one, um, I was just really blown away by this one. We all know where the copper mines are. But I had no idea it was such a big operation, and maybe I was the last one to know that, but I, I really did not know um, that it was a huge operation. I have several pictures of that, including the next one, which are, um, those are actually the work, there was actually a little village, apparently, up in there. The, uh, they provided houses for the workers. But it wasn't copper they were mining. What were they mining? Pyrites. So Pyrites, they okay. Okay. Well, now this was, um, I think this is 1907 here. Let me see. So um, I guess it could have been. Um, and the next one, yeah, that's in, uh, 1917. I'm sorry. So that would have been World War One. That's a good question. Ann, do you know why they called it the copper mines if they were mining because pyrite? The copper was originally found there before the Civil War, but it never was enough to, you know, just... They so they just continued to call it the copper mine and uh -huh. find something else. Well, that's kind of typical of Georgia, so... Uh -huh. All right, and the next one is another picture of the Finley yeah. Cut. That's the, uh, where they washed the ore down in the saying the Delonga method is called the trench there. And it's, nature has healed it somewhat, but uh, I've got a picture of actually a drawing of it showing what a deep thing it was. Yeah. They washed it, they uh, opened the gates at the end of the day and let all that wash down to the mill to be processed. That was a big well, a big reservoir. They had half a million gallons of water up there. Boom, opened it up and down it came. Yeah, trees and mud and everything else with it. Uh, the next one is a random slide, uh, but I couldn't resist. 
when I found it. Oh, not this one, sorry. That's, uh, that was actually a postcard of Lumpkin County. Now, I just don't understand. Usually postcards, like, come visit the beauty of so-and-so. And to me, that's about as ugly <laughs> as it gets. But uh, anyway, uh, somebody thought that was good to put on a postcard, maybe to get people to come and find gold. Uh, and Chris, I pulled that one for the, um, for the Bell people, uh, a dredge boat. Um, I don't know, would that be similar to the one that the diving bell would no, have been? No, Absolutely no. not? All right. This one was powered by electricity. So this is a variation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this was 1900, so. Mm -hmm. Chris, have you told them the dimensions of the loud boat, the diving bell boat? I don't think so. What we figured out, they actually kind of went back and forth, but the dimensions are uh, 50 feet long by 17 feet wide by 3 feet deep or 3 foot draft. Very, very shallow, flat bottom. Okay. More large. Yeah, it's not a barge. More, more like. More no, like. No. We, we had discussed this with Chris McCain as far as what is the proper terminology that we should refer to this as. And, and he said because it was such a unique boat, we should just refer to it as a diving bell boat. Diving bell boat. Else, right. a barge scow would not really apply. Okay. <laughs> Uh, this is the other random picture. I couldn't resist that. Uh, <laughs> and look in there. Uh, I assume you've seen that one before. Yeah, yeah. Now, that, is that your um, mother. mother? Okay, yeah. That's Mrs. Cochran there. Her yeah. husband carried the mail. He was known as Buck Cochran. He carried the mail all over the county. Well, like I said, nothing to do with the National Forest, but I ran up on it and I couldn't resist. <laughs> so, anyway, there it is. This is a gold rush uh, picture. This is your mother. Hmm? On, the on the left. On the left, yeah. The one that looks like Ann. Yeah, the one that looks like Ann, yeah. <laughs> oh, thank you. That's a Okay. All right. Uh, constructing roads. Uh, this one uh, just shows they're constructing Clay Creek Falls Road. And uh, a lot of times they cut these roads just so they could get the uh, federal government to come in and improve it. Uh, they learned that trick from Arthur Woody um, as well. Mm -hmm get to it. The next one. And uh, again, just um, scraping these mountainsides. You know what that's yeah, at, yeah. Right? No. That's by the reservoir, isn't it? Yeah, that's the Highway 52 bridge over the reservoir. That's Yahoo Creek at the bottom there. Mm -hmm. so that's, that's the, the old bridge, bridge yeah. at the bottom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And also, Bursty Powell told me that his father worked on that bridge. He was a blacksmith and that he they actually did the riveting right there. Really? On site. And the reason it's called Sugar Tit Hill, according to Madeline Anthony, was that um, going to the church, they were going to church, they'd be going up that hill, and they'd stop at a store and get some sugar and put it in a handkerchief and let the baby, baby. suck on it during church to keep them from crying. <laughs> so that's why it was called Sugar Tit Hill. I wondered if it was the shape or whatnot. I knew that was kind of like an early pacifier, but okay. All right, um, there's two schools of thought with the forest. There's preservation and there's conservation. And uh, a lot of the times, never the, the twain shall meet. Uh, preservation has to do, of course, with leaving everything just as it is. Conservation, which is actually what the early forest movement was about, was all about managed forest and timber harvest and whatnot. So I'm going to try to look at both of those. Um, the first is a preservation, and this is actually um, the next one, the 100th anniversary of the Weeks Act, and um, we probably should have made a bigger deal out of this here in the community. Okay, the next one, uh, the Weeks Act was named after John Wingate Weeks. Um, it actually started in 1907 when the American Forestry Association joined with local and regional groups and women's garden clubs to bring national attention to eastern forest. And I can tell you as a history teacher, women's clubs were a lot of the movers and the shakers in the second part of the 19th century and the early part of the 20th century. Uh, the organization's monthly magazine began featuring articles documenting the latest studies on flooding and forest and editorials tracing the legislative battles in Washington. Lumber manufacturing associations and magazines supported the forest movement, believing that government intervention was needed to stabilize the volatile lumber market. 
In other words, they were just blogging too much. Meanwhile, nature provided a case study of the important role forest cover plays in protecting watersheds. In March 1907, heavy rains brought floodwaters racing down the Monongahela River in West Virginia and caused $100 million in damage. The waters uh, surged into Pittsburgh, drowning people, destroying homes, left $8 million in damage there. Uh, the flood hit the same month that congressional opponents of Roosevelt's conservation agenda managed to overturn the Forest Reserve Act and place the power to create national forests in the hands of the legislative branch. While conservation organizations were at the halls of Congress, the U.S. Geological Survey had permission from nine states to determine what land should be purchased and declared national forest. Um, now what was needed was a federal law. So leadership on the issue came from a surprise source. Congressman John Weeks was a Republican from Massachusetts, was a former naval officer and a banker. Um, at one point he had declared that the federal government would quote unquote not spend one cent for scenery. He apparently changed his mind because in 1908, Weeks introduced a bill proposing that the federal government purchase lands near the headwaters of navigable streams by using receipts from already established forest reserves. The bill went nowhere. And I'll, I won't give you the blow by blow. Uh, for those of you that are history folks, um, Joe Cannon was Speaker of the House at the time. And uh, he was... Um, probably one of the most assertive speakers that we've ever had, and he personally blocked it until, again, changed his mind. And then on February, with his support, on February 15, 1911, it, did, uh, it got through the House and the Senate and was signed by President Taft on March 1st. So with the stroke of the pen, the watershed's uh, protection could begin. So now let's get to the Chattahoochee. All right, so what does the Chattahoochee have to do with all of this? Well, we have our own uh, Ranger Woody to help with the purchase of the forest. Uh, a lot of you have heard stories of Arthur Woody. He was called the Barefoot Ranger because he did not like to wear shoes. Uh, he did not like uniforms, and when he wore his uniform, it was usually unbuttoned. And uh, because he was rather a large guy, he also did not like to button the top button of his pants. So he would leave that open and use suspenders to, um, I guess, um, you know, retain some modesty. One suspender. Yeah. One suspender, maybe. Okay, go to the next one. Um, some of you may or may not know, but the Woody family is still in the area. Um, uh, his great-grandson is a friend of ours, Bill Woody, who used to be a practicing attorney uh, here. Uh, a lot of people did not know that, that, was, that he was actually the great-grandson of Arthur Woody. There we go. Um, and again, as I was talking earlier about how to get the road built, he was not a new dealer. He did not like Roosevelt. He, along with our own Herman Talmadge, thought the uh, new deal was a waste of money. But that did not keep him from taking advantage of it. And uh, he wanted a road built from Suches through Wolfpin Gap. That's actually the road that cuts off by Vogel. And Washington said they only had money to improve existing roads, so he, as the slide says, he and a bunch of guys got out there and just kind of hacked a trail through the woods. And uh, he was also nicknamed Kingfish, probably for obvious reasons. And um, then he let Washington know, okay, we've got our road, now you need to come down here and improve it. So they did. So... Um, he first joined the Forest Service crew as an axe man uh, in the, around 1914, best I could tell, and in 1915 he became a guard in the Forest Service, which at that time the U.S. Forest Service was more like a law enforcement agency. And by that time he was advocating that the federal government increase its purchases of land in the North Georgia mountains. And in 1918, um, they did. They started buying some of this land from, back from the timber companies and other places. It was first known as the Cherokee National Forest. 
Um, and then as additional land was purchased, uh, the Cherokee, uh, it broke off from the Cherokee and became the national, Chattahoochee National Forest. And Arthur Woody and Roscoe Nicholson became its first forest rangers. Um, go to the next one. Uh, one story that you may not, by the way, have any of you seen that talking um, Arthur Woody up on top of um, Brasstown Ball? I asked his great-grandson, Bill, if he knew it was up there. He said no. And I said, well, you really ought to go visit your great-grandpa sometime. And uh, I was thinking they could have at least have used one of the Woody family's, um, you know, men voices. But anyway, I don't know. They didn't. Um, where was I going with this? Uh, yes. All right. Arthur Woody also is responsible for restocking deer into North Georgia. One of his claims to fame, I guess, or infam in being infamous, his father reportedly shot the last white-tailed deer in North Georgia. So they were completely gone, which is hard to believe if you drive through any neighborhood around here. Um, he also was responsible for stocking the streams with trout. Most of the trout we have are not native trout, but he would uh, go out west go to North Carolina, Virginia, and buy rainbow trout and other types of trout. And personally, he stocked the streams with trout. Uh, he bought deer with his own money and transported them here and let them go in North Georgia. And they reproduced so rapidly that in 1941, they had to open the land to hunting to, get, to start culling the herd. And he understood that. But he had named all of them, and they were like friends. And they said when they fir the first hunting day, they said he went into a fairly serious depression from which he never really recovered. Um, and that's Ranger Woody. All right. Another naturalist uh, in Georgia is Leonard E. Foote, known to most people as Lynn Foote. It was a little harder to find information about him, and despite seeing a picture of him last weekend up at the Linfoot Inn, I could not find one on the internet. Uh, his special interest was wildflowers. He wrote two books on wildflowers um, and was known to be an acquaintance of Ed Dodd. Anybody remember who Ed Dodd is? You're showing your age if you do. Uh, Mark Trail. Mark Trail. Um, and Lynn Foote is supposed to be the model for Mark Trail. Now, there's another group that says that Charlie El Elliott, another naturalist in Georgia, was a model, but uh, the Linfoot Inn says it's um, Linfoot, and that's their story, and they're going to stick to it. Uh, I think this is the only wilderness in the United States named for a cartoon character. Uh, in South Georgia, there is kind of a pogo, um, something around uh, the Okefenokee, but uh, not a wilderness area. Um, and I strayed off a little bit uh, to talk about, because again, the forest impact on the community, um, I, because I spent the night there last Saturday night, first time I had been up there, I wanted to talk just briefly about the Linfoot hike in. Have any of y'all been up there? Any of y'all stayed up there? It is. You, uh, you walk five miles up there. Yeah, the only way to get there is to hike five miles in. Um, not the worst hike I've ever been on, but it was not um, a stroll. And um, it is designed by Dahlonega's own Garland Reynolds. I didn't know that. And um, it's all, it, it is the, one of only four, if I understand this correctly, LEED certified ends in the United States. And that means leadership and environmental. Um, it's not painted on the inside. They're not totally self-sustaining. They do use solar panels. Um, and if you go to the next slide, it talks a little bit more about that. Um, they use composting toilets. That's very interesting. Um, but um, unlike outhouses, they really don't smell. Uh, they use solar panels, uh, wood stoves, rain barrels. They compost all their food waste and paper. Uh, and you must clean your plate. You sit at and eat family style at the table and take all you want, but they encourage you not to take any more because at the end of the meal, they weigh all the scraps that are left over from all 40 guests. And if there's more than four ounces, they've got a board in the dining hall and they put, you know, like 
dinner, you know, for this group, and they'll give you a frowny face. So nobody wants a frowny face. So you, you, uh, you clean your plate. Um, and cleaning it is not hard. I can personally testify after walking uh, five miles. As a matter of fact, our group was uh, recognized for not only did we leave zero waste, most of us felt we could have probably eaten some more if it were available, but it was not. But we were, we were good. Food was good. Um, they use rainwater harvesting, and they use earthworms. Uh, instead of sending the ends organic waste to a landfill, the staff recycles it back into the soil using red wiggler worm beds. They hold about 40 to 50 pounds of worms that can eat half their body weight in a day. And they compost for everything from kitchen scraps to off office paper. So pretty neat. So I think uh, some of the uh, early ones would um, approve of that. All right. So now we finally get to Benton Mackay and what was his connection to the forest and to the Appalachian Trail. Uh, There's another view of him on the next slide. Um, he's shown there with Myron Avery. It is Myron Avery that actually ended up fulfilling the dream of the Appalachian Trail because he and Benton Mackay um, parted ways, and uh, Bitt Mackay wanted the Appalachian Trail built a certain way in a certain area, did not get his way, so he kind of abandoned the project in a way, and Myron Avery fulfilled it, but that's still not to say that Bitt Mackay was not important, and I have one more picture of him as a young man, and that is now the Bitt Mackay Trail. So, let's look a little bit more about Bitt Mackay, and it'll be on the next slide. Um, he is actually the first person who proposed the idea of an Appalachian Trail in his 1921 article, um, An Appalachian Trail, a Project in Regional Planning. Um, and if you look up on the slide, um, you can see, you know, his parents, he comes from an odd family. He was, um, his parents were both struggling playwrights, which I thought was interesting, especially the fact that his mom was. <laughs> He entered Harvard in 1896. He majored in forestry, uh, and while he was there, he met John Muir, who started the Sierra Club, and Gifford Pinchot, and Gifford Pinchot is known as father of the National Forest System. Um, got his degree in forestry, um, married suffragette Betty Stubbs in 1915. They were very active. But uh, for some unexplained reason, they never went into it, she committed suicide in 1921 by drowning herself in the East River in New York. And uh, he never got over it. Uh, he never remarried. And um, I think that's when the idea of the Appalachian Trail really developed, it just kind of a self kind of healing process. Um, but without him, it, it's very unlikely that the Appalachian Trail would have ever been built. He um, convened the first Appalachian Trail Conference in Washington in 1925, and it was a gathering of hikers, foresters, and public officials. Uh, they established an organization called the Appalachian Trail Conference. Its now, name has now been changed to the Conservancy, and Mackay was appointed as the field organizer in his beloved mountains, where again he went to heal himself. To make Mackay's idea a reality, many small trail clubs and volunteer groups formed throughout the Appalachian region to work on the trail in their local area. And the, it actually progressed into the 20s and 30s. The ATC, or the Appalachian Trail Conservancy, was established to coordinate and manage the workings as well as several state and federal agencies. And it was completed in August of 1937 when the Civilian Conservation Corps got involved and connected the ridge between Spalding and Sugarloaf Mountains in Maine. In 1968, Congress passed the National Trail System Act, making the Appalachian Trail a national scenic trail and essentially a linear national park. Um, the act also authorized funds to protect the trail by surrounding the entire route with public land. So I think probably most of y'all here have hiked at least. Any any end-to-end -end hikers in here? Or okay, so you've gone all the way. All right, any uh, that have at least gone through all the Georgia part or another? Okay, very good. Yeah. I've done Georgia. 
I haven't quite done all Georgia yet. Okay, so let's talk about this other trail. In uh, 19, well, actually before that, in 1979, a group of people got together and decided that uh, Benton Mackay was the forgotten man uh, as far as the Appalachian Trail goes. And they wanted to realize his vision of building a trail to honor him along what he envisioned as the original route of the Appalachian Trail. And the next one. And uh, one other thing before we get more deeply into the trail. Mackay also, along with Aldo Leopold, if you're into any kind of wilderness riding at all, uh, Aldo Leopold. Um, is one of the great writers of preservation. And Bob Marshall founded the Wilderness Society, which is still a very active society in preservation. Uh, Benton Mackay did live to be 96 years old. He died in December of 1975, so he never saw the realization of the Benton Mackay Trail. Um, but I'm sure he would approve. And also I want to make a remark about the age of some of these guys too at the end. Um, now, if you're familiar at all with the Appalachian Trail, you can see the Benton Mackay, which also starts at Springer Mountain, uh, actually shares the treadway with the Appalachian Mountain, uh, with the Appalachian Trail for a while, but then it veers off to the west, and it is blazed by a um, diamond, a white diamond. And the next slide shows one of my favorite places along the Benton Mackay, uh, which is a 264. 65 foot long suspension footbridge, which I did not know um, was the longest one east of the Mississippi. Have any of y'all seen that one? Yeah, it's, uh, it's beautiful especially, and I've been on it many different times of the year, and it doesn't matter what time you're out there, it's, it's gorgeous, whether it's full of the fall leaves, I've seen it full of ice, and um, it, it really is cool to go out there. Yes. I mean, I mean, it's just a beautiful place to go hang out. So you can know. you go there if you're not a hiker? Not yes, there? yes. This is only, uh, you go down a dirt road. Well, there's, there's a couple of ways in, but there's a short way in that's really only about half a mile down to it that you can drive to within about half a mile and walk down. I'll be glad to take you there sometime. Oh, yeah, if you want. And uh, again, this is just more of a top of the bit in Mackay. Um, I would like to do all of it in Georgia. I, this one's almost doable. It, it, it kind of skirts the southern border of the Smoky Mountain uh, National Park and then terminates up at Davenport Gap. What, what is the dotted line? Appalachian. The dotted line is the Appalachian Trail. Okay. Yeah. And then the red one is the Benton Mackay. It got kind of fuzzy when I blew it up, so I do apologize for that. Do you know what the reason was? for Benton Mackay's passion to go west in, in that direction? He thought it was more rugged, um, that that was more rugged and beautiful, and uh, Avery wanted to take the path of least resistance. Some of that land at the time was not available, and the land to the east was, and so Myron uh, Avery just said, let's just take the path of least resistance and go this way, and I think it, it was just Mackay had it in his mind what he wanted, and that was not it. So that's when he kind of walked away. But that trail is also protected with land that's been... Well, it's, it's within the Chattahoochee National Forest oh, now, okay. so it's just, yeah. Oh, okay. um, yeah, they didn't, uh, from what I understand, they really didn't have to purchase anything. It just kind of went land through land that's, that was already owned. So it's almost 300 miles. It was officially completed in 2005. Uh, intersects with the Appalachian Trail on either end, so it makes a nice loop trail. And um, that was kind of what um, he wanted, anyway, Bit Mackay. And it goes through uh, what they say is some of the most remote backcountry in Georgia, Tennessee, and North Carolina. Now, I don't know if that means more remote than the Appalachian Trail, but um, still, I, can't, I haven't done it firsthand, so I can't... Um, speak to it precisely. And then the last slide, oh, next slide, sorry about that. Uh, Roy Arnold was the first to walk the proposed route 27 years ago, and I think this is hilarious. Um, he's still with us, but he makes the point that Mackay, uh, Lynn Foote, and Charlie Elliott all died in their 90s. 
So, um, you know, that uh, would make it a good place to retire to because you could be assured of having a long retirement, I guess. So. And then the last slide. This is the last slide. Uh, last year we were designated, this year, excuse me, this year we were designated as an official Appalachian Trail site that we are a community that um, supports the trail, that, um, you know, we uh, are involved with the trail, and that did not turn out well at all. You can't see the writing. I actually changed it from uh, white to black so you could see it better. But um, anyway, so we are an official. I will try to answer trail. questions, but what I would really like is for any gaps trail. that I left in the so program to be filled in by some of you that uh, are also well versed in any comments about any hikers on the Benton Mackay? All right. The Benton Mackay Trail was actually built uh, in reaction to the possibility that they were going to extend the Blue Ridge Parkway all the way down through Georgia. Mm. And it was going to lay right on the top of the Appalachian mm. Trail. So the Appalachian Trail Club, the Georgia Appalachian Trail Club, and the Forest Service built the Benton Mackay Trail in Georgia. And then when funding ran out in 68 for the proposed extension of the Blue Ridge Parkway, uh, there was a trail there that uh, was not going to be, that was going to be the new AT. So that's when some members of the Georgia Appalachian Trail Club formed the Benton Mackay Trail Association, and they took over management and uh, protection of the Benton Mackay Trail itself. Okay. Well, okay. Thanks for filling in that, that piece of the puzzle. When, uh, what about the Pinhoti Trail? Now, that's kind of controversial now. Uh, are y'all, do y'all know what I'm talking about when I say the Pinhoti Trail? The Pinhoti Trail is, I think it, it exists. It's sore subject with some people, maybe. Um, you want the southern terminus of the Appalachian Trail to remain in Springer Mountain? Okay. Well, and the Pinhoti people want it to be in Birmingham, is that where it ends? Yeah. Talladega National Tal Talladega. Yeah. These two guys right here are past presidents in North Appalachian Trail. Okay. So they have the Maybe they can introduce themselves. Yes, please. Uh, These are guests. Yeah. Introduce yourselves. And if I got anything wrong, don't don't hesitate to correct me. So, um, you did. Well, very interesting what you're going to say. Yeah. Jerry has actually been. Uh, I've served on the board of Linfield Inn. And something you may not realize is that they, they do a couple of things. They give the Georgia Appalachian Trail Club a nice grant each year for us to uh, sponsor and work with uh, school children in all the northeast counties that have uh, that abut in the trail. But also they provide a scholarship to a North Georgia College student uh, each year who uh, uh, aspire to be uh, sign, uh, work in the biology, uh, ecology area. So that, they do a nice job there. And Jerry is a, he was born and raised right here. In I lived my first 21 years. All right. Well, very good. So it's not my first event here. Well, you know, that explains something to me. When I was at the Linfoot last weekend, they had a naturalist, um, and she had only been there, I think, a couple of months, and she does uh, at 5 o'clock every evening, they do a tour of the Linfoot, and you go down and you see the composting and, um, you know, learn how everything works. And um, she identified herself as a naturalist, and I thought, well, that's a pretty cushy job, just one hour a day, giving a tour. But obviously she, she must be involved with uh, the school program as well. She was an educator. Uh, you're, you're a forester? I am not. I'm a, I'm a history teacher, yeah. <laughs> well, I probably should have been a forester, yeah. Maybe you can help with this. In the first half of your presentation about forestry, logging, um, I've always been amazed at the sheer volume of the logging that was done in the Appalachians and the time frame that you gave and actually a little beyond that. Uh, my question is an economics question. What were the markets that had a demand for, must have been billions of board feet, hundreds of billions of board feet of an awful lot of uh, hardwood as well as evergreen timber. I, I could never fathom that many boats or mills or barns or houses being built. Well, I, I just uh, came back from three weeks up in, in my hometown, Green Bay, Wisconsin. Yeah. And uh, it was through the, they had a nice presentation there 
early Green Bay, but Fort Howard at that time. Uh, and it's similar scenes to what we saw here, just all over virgin timber being harvested, and, yeah. and I had the same uh, idea. But it actually was the major industry, and it was, if you think about it, it was the primary building material. I mean, we didn't have uh, girders or, or uh, any other kind of construction material. Everything that was built was built of wood, including wagons and yeah. cranes and, and everything else. I think we did some export to Britain we, yeah. and Europe. Was there, there was some of that too. Yeah. There, there was some export, but also during that time, we had a huge population boom in this country. It was a, a, not only the self, you know, um, population, but the, the Im immigration yeah. was tremendous during that time. And a lot of the places, we think of New York just like, you know, building out of concrete and steel, but if you look at the pictures of that era, a lot of those tenements were actually wood, which is another reason they had those devastating fires up there. Right. So, yeah. The great wealth of the United States was based on timber. Uh, initially, America did that, it exported timber, the, the big straight uh, southern pines that we used for masts, for, for right. straight masts for ships. Yeah. A lot of lumber was exported and, and brought in a lot of wealth into this country. And then, as Bill said, it was just the predominant <coughs> Building material. He just use yeah. And burning it too. A lot too. of markets. A yeah. lot of markets. Yeah. Continuous. So yes. that, that would explain that. If you have 40, 50 years of national and some international consumption in many different product lines, I can begin to see that you would cut down billions of trees. The, the uh, in the uh, east began a little further north of here right. and, and, and basically clear cut it out in the uh, late 1800s and it gradually moved south so that River and others moved in um, in the early 1900s and bought fast tracks in the Smokies as well as in the Cohetas and uh, this part of the country here. Yeah, after the easy timber was cut, then they had to start going into the, the haulers. Yeah. But the Vogel company, was what they were after was not just the timber, but they were really after the, the bark for tanning. Yes. And before yes. World War I, they didn't have the chemicals to do leather production, they had to use tannin off of barks, and they were actually taking the bark off the trees from here in Georgia and shipping it up to their tanning places. And I think they were in Wisconsin, but I'm not sure. Yeah, thanks for adding that. Yeah, they were they were tanners. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Question to about the Benton Country Trail. I hiked on a piece of it last Saturday in Cherry Lock Mountain. Cherry Lock. Why yeah. would you put it in a subdivision? <laughs> that's the only, that's the place where the, it's not on, on public land. And it goes through the Sisson development right, there. Right. And uh, that's the only way to really jump across uh, 515, yeah. is right through there. And, and that is unfortunate. <laughs> There's no public property there. There's no public property to get it on. It's just thousands of people. Yeah, it is. It's land. Well, it's not the wilderness. Uh, one interesting little tale, my, my, my dad uh, back in World War II had contracts for the government to a lot of parts of Lumpkin County, uh, particularly up in the New World area, and uh, they typically would cut what's called cross arms. They're four by fours, eight feet long, and the Army bought them to string communications wires. And, uh, but they had a special contract when the uh, airfield at Augusta, I believe it was Camp Wheeler, they were building the hangars and they required uh, some wooden beams 80 feet long. And uh, if, if you've ever been from uh, Forest Service 28 there at New Wheel Church going back east there, you know how it twists and turns, but it's really pretty straight today as compared to what it was 50 years ago. But anyway, they, the Army required beams 80 feet long and uh, someone in Forest Service went out and, and scouted it and found some uh, white pine uh, that met those specifications and they contracted with my dad to, uh, to get them out to Nimbrill Church. And they were so long that they couldn't put them on a truck. First of all, they didn't have a trailer truck that long. So they had to pull them out with a little crawl cracker around all that way. So they pulled them out oh, wow. seven or eight miles across the old road there. Don't have any pictures of that, do they? No. I love <laughs> What's name? Anybody else? This is awesome. Thank you guys for coming. This is great.